this video we'll be looking at synapses and specifically look at how a cholinergic synapse actually works. So the synapse is referring to the junction between two neurons and we say that uh, the, uh, it is able to transmit impulses by neurotransmitters from one neuron to the other. So the way to think about it is because we say that neurons are specialized nerve cells that actually transmit uh, impulses by action potential. But the thing is, we don't have one single neuron that connects from the tips of our fingers to all the way to our brain to kind of tell us what's going on. They're actually made up of loads of uh, neurons in between, which are able to... Um, all of these neurons actually need to connect together. But physically, there's always going to be that gap, and that gap is synapses. And the way that the synapses uh, work is that they have loads of physicals of neurotransmitters inside them. And when the electrical impulse comes in, it would trigger the release of these neurotransmitters, which diffuse across the synapse to the other neuron, which triggers a brand new uh, electrical impulse. Now, the thing is, there are actually different types of neurotransmitters because sometimes we want the nerve impulse to actually carry through to allow us to do something, but sometimes we actually want them to not transmit that signal any further. So for an excitatory neurotransmitter uh, like acetylcholine, they can actually uh, trigger a new actogen potential to be generated in the neuron after the synapse, hence we call it postsynaptic neuron. Whereas an inhibitory neurotransmitter, an example that you need to be aware of is called GABA, does not trigger the new action potential. Uh, you won't necessarily be asked to uh, name different types of neurotransmitter, but it's definitely helpful for you to remember these two specific examples of the different types of neurotransmitters that we can have. So now we have a look at how the cholinergic synapse actually works to trigger a new action potential. So first of all, uh, before we actually start looking at how it works, it will be helpful for us to know uh, what are some of the structures uh, that we have. So first of all, this is what we call the presynaptic neuron, or at least the ending of the presynaptic neuron. So that's where the impulse will come in. Uh, and on the presynaptic neuron, there are a couple of structures that it's worth knowing. Uh, first of all, we've got these structures here. These are uh, what we call voltage-gated uh, calcium ion channels. So as the name implies, uh, the calcium ions channels would either open or close depending on the uh, state of polarization of the membrane. So for example, we say when the impulse comes in, uh, it will depolarize the membrane there, and once it reaches the threshold, these calcium ion channels will then open, very much like how the uh, voltage-gated sodium ion channels would work in an action potential along the membrane. So again, if you're not sure, it would be helpful to go back to that video about action potential to see how, how it actually works. But the point is that on the surface of the presynaptic neuron, they would have loads of these voltage-gated uh, calcium ion channels. And we say that there are loads of calcium ions on the outside of the neuron. So there's a higher concentration on the outside than inside the neuron there. And inside the presynaptic neuron, they will have uh, vesicles that contain acetylcholine. And the shorthand for acetylcholine will be ACH. And then we've got the synapse, which is the gap in between. Then we've got the postsynaptic neuron on the other end. So on the postsynaptic neuron, the key ones to look at would be uh, these particular uh, proteins on the surface of it as well. These are what we call the postsynaptic sodium ion channels. And these uh, postsynaptic sodium ion channels, as the name implies, would actually open to allow an influx of sodium ions. So again, there will be loads of sodium ions on the outside. Now, you would notice they also have something sticking out of them, and these are representing the receptor site of the sodium ion channels. So we say that these receptors are coupled with these protein channels so when they uh, and they are specific to acetylcholine. So once the acetylcholine is able to diffuse across the synapse and bind with these receptors, they will then open up like this one here. This is basically the structure. So let's have a think about how it actually works. So first of all, let's say the uh, impulse actually arrives. There's an action potential coming in from the presynaptic neuron. And once it reaches the ending of it, because these calcium ion channels are uh, voltage-gated, the, the polarization of the membrane will cause these calcium ion channels to open. Because of that, the calcium ions would then uh, rush into the uh, presynaptic neuron um, down the electrochemical gradient. So when the calcium is in here, it will be able to move the uh, acetylcholine vesicles to the cell surface membrane, and then they fuse with it. 
and because of this fusion, they would release the acetylcholine uh, into the synaptic cleft. So imagine these are the acetylcholine molecules and they would diffuse across uh, the synaptic cleft towards the other end. So it's, it's simply diffusion across the uh, gap there. And once the um, acetylcholine actually reaches the other end, they would bind to these receptors, which then open up these postsynaptic sodium ion channels. And once they open, the sodium ions would actually again have a massive influx down the electrochemical gradient again into the membrane, which causes the membrane to depolarize once more, generating a new action potential to be uh, to occur in the postsynaptic neuron. So this is how it works. So just a very quick recap. We said the action potential arrives at the presynaptic neuron, which causes the voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open. Calcium ions uh, influx and diffuse down the electrochemical gradient into the presynaptic neuron, and then the calcium ions will cause these vesicles with the neurotransmitter to move and fuse with the presynaptic membrane. Because these vesicles contain the uh, neurotransmitter, or acetylcholine in this case, these acetylcholine will be released into the synaptic cleft and they would diffuse across uh, to the postsynaptic neuron. Then the acetylcholine would bind to the receptor, uh, receptor site on the actual postsynaptic membrane, which is coupled with these sodium ion channels. So therefore the sodium ion channels would then open to allow an influx of sodium ions down the electrochemical gradient again into the neuron. And because of this depolarization, they would be able to generate a new action potential to be sent along the next uh, neuron there. So this is how an excitatory neurotransmitter would cause, uh, would be able to transmit that electrical impulse. Now, of course, we don't actually want the acetylcholine to be stay uh, to stay stuck on the receptors because what would happen is that the sodium ion channels will continuously go in, and actually that means that there is no stopping of that new signal and we don't want to have a continuous influx and a continuous generation of action potential because you kind of go into a seizure because you're continuously receiving that excitation, uh, uh, excitatory impulse. So we need to find some way to stop the, uh, stop the release of the new action potential and to do that, we have to break the acetylcholine down. Now, previously we mentioned that the acetylcholine would be, would be bound to the uh, receptor uh, on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron over here. Now, the way that we need to remove them is it relies on a particular enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. So the shorthand is ACHE. So acetylcholine esterase is actually a very, very interesting enzyme. It is one of the most efficient enzyme in the world. It has a very, very quick reaction rate and it can very quickly break the acetylcholine down into its constituents. So through that, they will be broken down into two parts. Uh, one of them is called uh, choline and the other one is acetate. So um, acetate, or sometimes you might have seen them as ethanoic acid, is actually the same thing. So imagine, let's say it's over here, these uh, choline and acetate will be will diffuse back to the presynaptic neuron because again, it's about down the concentration gradient. In the presynaptic neuron, there will be mitochondria as well. Now these mitochondria would do, obviously do aerobic respiration to release uh, ATP out. And ATP can be used to combine acetate and choline back together into acetylcholine. So nothing is actually ever lost. So both of them would be combined back together into the acetylcholine inside a vesicle like that. So everything is actually recycled in this process. There is no acetylcholine that is completely being lost. So again, as a summary, uh, in order to stop the nerve impulse to continuously be generated at the postsynaptic neuron, uh, acetylcholine esterase, an enzyme, comes in to break the acetylcholine in down into its constituent, which is acetate or ethanoic acid and choline. And after that, acetate and choline will be uh, would diffuse back to the uh, presynaptic neuron, be taken in uh, through the membrane. The mitochondria in the presynaptic neuron would give out ATP, which is used to combine these two things back into acetylcholine, essentially recycling it. Uh, because there's no more acetylcholine, they would no longer be able to uh, carry on having a new action potential. So therefore, that's the end of that transmission. Mm -hmm.